we're about to explore a very difficult subject, not difficult uh, doctrinally, not difficult in terms of uh, some intellectual challenge, um, difficult in gaining the right degree of concern. It's very easy to overreact to some of these things. I'm anxious for that not to happen. And yet, it's also, we need to realize that the, the one certain barrier to truth is the presumption you already have it. And most of you know that our trademark for three or four decades at least has been Acts 1711. That uh, be like the Bereans in that they receive the word of God with all openness of mind and yet search the scriptures daily to prove whether those things be so. And for many of those years, most of those years, I always felt that the real challenge was part two, searching the scriptures daily to prove whether those things be so. In more recent years, though, I've come to realize that the more difficult part is the first part, and that's to have a readiness of mind, an open mind. And so for tonight, I'm uh, hoping, trusting, that you will keep your minds open, blindfold your prejudices and stand back and do two things. Be open to new information if there is new information coming on the one hand, but don't overreact. Don't, don't fold up your cares and head for the hills and so forth. Um, it's a, we have some storm warnings flying. And for lack of a better title, I'm using that here, the storm warnings for 2011. And so... We had a question in the little pre-discussion here about trillion. We've got a new label in our vocabulary. And you've probably heard me use this before, but I want to use it again. I want to talk a little bit about quantities. Often we have a larger quantity as something, nothing but a much larger quantity. But sometimes things get so large they are qualitatively non-comparable. How much, I mean, let's talk seconds. We could talk, we could talk a lot of other things, but probably what most of us have a grasp of is seconds, 60 seconds to a minute, 60 minutes to an hour, 24 hours to a day, and so forth, right? And uh, it's linear, and most of us experience it as being uniform. Some of us that are older realize that life is more like a roll of toilet paper. It goes faster near the end, okay? But let's assume, let's assume I owed you some money and I told you that I will pay you what I owe you in a million seconds from now. Well, you grab your little calculator and you quickly find out that a million seconds is 12 days. That's no big deal. You'll wait 12 days. You can probably put up with that. That seems fair. Uh, I'm sorry, I misspoke. I'm, I, I didn't mean million. I'll pay you in a billion second. That's with a B, not an M. Well, you take out your calculator. You quickly find out that a billion seconds is 32 years. That's quite a different thing. That's not just more seconds. That's not just a few more slips of 12 days each. The difference between a million and a billion is the difference between 12 days and 32 years. And except, I'm sorry, I misspoke again. I really meant to say, I'll pay you back in a trillion seconds. Well, you get your calculator if you think you need it. It's 32,000 years. Ouch, I heard it. Yes, exactly. You just found out you're not going to get paid. <laughs> Million, billion, trillion. 12 days to 32 years to 32,000 years. Those are qualitatively different. And we're worrying about how big, a, not how big the budget should be, how big the deficit to the budget should be. It should be treasonous to even talk in terms of trillions. That's ridiculous. I forget whether it's Deborah Erickson or, 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 or was a Tip O'Neill who made the classic crack years ago. He says, a billion here and a billion there, and pretty soon you're talking real money. <laughs> and, and he was attempting to be facetious, right? No, these quantities, the, the, the kind of, I, I am a very, uh, I'm not really that politically oriented, but I regard most of what's going on in the legislature as treason. 
These people took an oath of office to defend the Constitution, and they have no gr- they, and they sign bills they haven't read. They should be in prison for that, in my opinion. If you had gone to business, in, if you'd gone into business the day that Jesus was born, and the business you had you put together lost a million dollars every day. Every day, a million dollars, 365 days a year. It would, how long would it take you to have lost a trillion dollars? You started when Jesus was born, and it would take you till October of the year 2737 to lose one trillion dollars. And that's what they're frittering away, not for the budget, for the amount that they missed their budget with. You've got to be kidding. That's insanity. The most significant day of 2011. What is the most significant day in 2011? 2011 promised to be the most challenging opportunity of our lifetimes. There are nonlinearities compounding on our personal... Her- Let me back up a minute. That's a term that we use around the campus here a little bit. Most of us think linearly. Tomorrow will be like yesterday. Next week like last week. Next month like last month. Next year it will be sort of like last year. We think linearly. We extrapolate linearly because it's just, it's useful for most, you know, us estimating. Non, but we do that in a world that is intrinsically nonlinear. Our world is full of nonlinearities. You can have a medical stroke at any moment. You weren't expecting it. You can have a financial surprise, uh, being fired or whatever. These are nonlinearities, often not expected, obviously. We have, no, we have nonlinearities that are compounding on our both personal and national horizons that's going to test every one of us in terms of our preparations and our commitments to our callings. That's why we're here tonight, and that's what I'm going to try to deal with here. There's also another term that you may or may not have come across, but it's going to be something you'll read more and more about in recent times, a thing called the normalcy bias. And it's just what it really boils down to is the intrinsic belief that if you haven't experienced something yourself, it probably won't happen. In other words, it can't happen here. We read about the Weimar Republic and the hyperinflation in Germany back in the 30s and whatever, and we don't relate to that happening here. It just, we haven't experienced it personally, so we don't really visualize it happening here. You talk to a Holocaust survivor and they'll have a different attitude. That's, it's, a, it's a fancy word for the conviction that it can't happen here. Most Americans are oblivious to a forthcoming day which will be the most significant day of this calendar year. I'm not sure it'll be this calendar year. It has a highly likelihood of being this calendar year. If it isn't in this calendar year, somehow it gets into next year, it won't be very far away. Gold, which some people call the anti-dollar, has been telling us for 10 straight years that a crisis is coming. Gold was about $250 $252 an ounce in the summer of 1999. It's now around $1,600 per ounce. What's wrong with this picture? Gold is up sixfold against the U.S. dollar, and that's not a great statement of confidence in the world's reserve currency. So let's review some basic background. Let's stand back and realize what won World War II was the industrialization of America. We were at the forefront of the Industrial Revolution. It was America that showed the world how to mass produce everything from automobiles to televisions to airplanes. It was the great American manufacturing base that crushed Germany and Japan in World War II. There are lots of other factors, don't misunderstand me, but that was a huge major aspect of what our adversaries faced. Let's talk about the deindustrialization of America. The United States has lost, since 2001, 
approximately 42,000 factories. 75% of those factories employed over 500 people when they were still in operation. These layoffs weren't temporary layoffs till things get better. These were plants that were shut down and are not going to open again. I'll show you why in a minute. We live in the age of deceit. They tell us unemployment in America is now over 10%. Nonsense. It's over 20%. One in five is out of work. The real world is probably more like 22%, according to the shadow government statistics, who make their living trying to measure this more accurately. How do they lie so easily? By not counting people that are, looking, that are not employed. Because of all kinds of, they take all kinds of reasons to not count them, which distort the statistic. Have you ever wondered why unemployment in America refuses to go away? or even get better, in spite of all the government-fed Wall Street propaganda and disinformation about a recovery in progress, with trillions of dollars in bailouts and stimulus, stimuli. We could go into lots of charts and stuff, but I thought it was much simpler just to notice how Porter Stanbury expresses this. Here's why there are no jobs in America. Here's the deal. You're going to start a business or expand the one you've got now doesn't really matter what you do and what you're going to do. I'll partner with you no matter what business you're in as long as it's legal. But I can't give you any capital. You'll have to come up with that on your own. I won't give you any labor. That's definitely up to you. What I will do, however, is demand that you follow all sorts of rules about what products and services you can offer, how much and how often you pay your employees, and where and when you're allowed to operate your business. That's my role in the affair to tell you what to do. Cool, huh? Now, in return for my rules, I'm going to take roughly half of whatever you make in the business each year. Half seems fair, doesn't it? I think so. Of course, that's half of your profits. You're also going to have to pay me about 12% of whatever you decide to pay your employees because you've got to cover my expenses for promulgating all of the rules about who you can employ, when, where, and how. Come on, you're my partner. It's only fair. Now, after you've put your hard-earned savings at risk to start this business, and after you've worked hard at it for a few decades, paying me my 50% or a bit more along the way each year, you might decide you'd like to cash out, to finally live the good life. Whether or not this is fair, some people never can afford to retire, is a different argument. As your partner, I'm happy for you to sell whatever you'd like because your agreement says... If you sell, you pay me an additional 20% of whatever the capitalized value of your business is at that time. I know, I know, you put up all the original capital, you took all the risks, you put in all the labor, that's true. But I've done my part too. I've collected 50% of the profits each year, and I've always come up with more rules for you to follow each year. Therefore, I deserve another final 20% slice of the business. Now, I'm sure you think my offer is reasonable and happily uh, partner with me, but it doesn't really matter how you feel about it. Because if you ever try to stiff me or cheat me in any way of my fees or rules, I'll break down your door in the middle of the night, threaten you and your family with heavy automatic weapons, and throw you in jail. That's how civil society is supposed to work, right? This is America, isn't it? That's America with a K, by the way. That's the offer America gives its entrepreneurs. And the idiots in Washington wonder why there are no new jobs. Because the smart money is going offshore elsewhere to do that, these very things. As I was looking for clips to get across some of these guys, I've, I stumbled on another one that I just couldn't resist including here, if you'll let me, on Obamacare. I'm not sure exactly where it came from. It's attributed to Donald Trump, and it probably was, but let's give him the benefit of the doubt here anyway. Um, let me get this straight. We're going to be gifted with a health care plan where we're forced to purchase and find if we don't, which purportedly covers at least 10 million more people without adding a single new doctor, but provides for 16,000 new IRS agents, written by a committee whose chairman says he doesn't understand it, passed by a Congress that didn't read it, but exempted themselves from it, and signed <laughs> by a president who smokes <laughs> with funding administered by a treasury chief who didn't pay his taxes for which we'll be taxed for four years before any benefits take effect by a government which has already bankrupt Social Security and Medicare, 
all to be overseen by a surgeon general who is obese and financed by a country that's broke. <laughs> is there something wrong with this picture? <laughs> that does sound Donald, like Donald Trump, doesn't it? I, I don't want to do him any justice, but I think that's it. The point of all of this is the United States is not immune from the results of its current fiscal policies. The problem is our, they're treating this as if we have a problem in liquidity. If you have a business in trouble with liquidity, you can solve the problem by getting some cash or some borrowing. Our problem is there's too much debt. Our problem is not liquidity, it's solvency. If you have too much debt, the answer isn't more debt. We're doing all the wrong, we're making it worse and worse and worse and worse. Some people argue that's deliberate. I won't get into that debate. The worst day for Americans in 2011 will be the day that the dollar is vetoed as the world's reserve currency. I understand that if you go through Singapore trying to give somebody a $100 bill, they won't take it. They don't want dollars. We're beginning to see that happen. China, the IMF, everywhere you look, you see people preparing for pushing for the relief of the dollar as the world's reserve currency. Some people are proposing baskets, some people are doing other things. Clearly, the, the <laughs> destruction of the dollar is almost complete. When the Federal Reserve can no longer simply print more money to bail us out and pay its debts, the cost of everything will go up. See, the only reason we can print more money is because that money is accepted as a world currency. When that stops, that paper is worthless. The day that the dollar is no longer the world's currency is the day that your gas pump will probably cost you somewhere between $5 and $10 a gallon, maybe more. What's that going to do to the cost of the goods that are shipped? What's that going to do to the cost of food on the shelves in the stores? What's that going to do to commuting patterns? The, co the country is going to come apart, I believe. We have an Office of Special Investigator General for the Troubled Asset Relief Program, the TARP programs. Most people think that's one program. No, it's actually 50 different programs. And since 2007, it adds up to $23 trillion. And if you look at the quarter report in the lower right-hand corner, that's the number. of all 50, There's a whole bunch of these different programs that have been going as fast as they can put them together. 27.3, actually the number is larger than that, but just leave it there. The, to obtain a debt of 27.3 trillion, you would have to lose, from the day that Christ was born, over $32 million per day for every day since he was born to get that kind of number. The current debt, we can go through all these numbers. These numbers, the direct debts add up to f over 50, call it 53 trillion dollars, but that's not the big Part of it, add the accruals for Social Security and Medicare, you got another 65 trillion, that's with a T, U.S. banks, in addition to whole derivative obligations that have been estimated by a number of different numbers, all over 200 trillion. So if you've been paying attention, that's over 300 trillion so far. One of the acknowledged experts in this area, Kotlikoff at Boston University, often quoted by the IMF and elsewhere, the government debt is not 13 and a half trillion. He's talking about the current, anyway, but 14 times higher net, 200 trillion. In other words, let's get real. The U.S. is bankrupt. That's the net of it. Now, this debt crisis isn't just federal. It's now impacting nearly half of all the U.S. states and thousands of our counties, cities, and towns. Police, fire, and other emergency services are being cut. There are major cities in which the police are not being paid. Can you imagine what's going on in the crime rate? Do you now understand why every gun manufacturer has been working around the clock for several years now, trying to keep up with the demand for personal protection arms? Healthcare services are being limited or eliminated altogether. Schools and universities are losing funding and being forced to raise tuition costs. That'll help everything. Maintenance of roads, bridges, and even electrical grids are being curtailed. They're already not considered standard by many people who measure those things. Thousands of state, county, and city jobs are being cut. And to add insult to injury, their taxes are, of course, being raised. 
all because state and local governments can't pay their bills. Prominent Wall Street analysts are now warning that up to 100 major U.S. cities and states will go bust this year, this calendar year. It's already starting. The combined effect of all these things makes the Y2K at its worst fear, the worst at, at its peak, look like kindergarten compared to this. If you look at Bonanski's money printing, Y2K and 9 are little blips on the uh, hardly show compared to what's been going on in the last couple of years. Unbelievable. Unbelievable. The wildest Fed money printing of all time. What does that mean? That means on your backs. The whole charade between the Federal Reserve and the Treasury Department is to finesse all this onto your shoulders. Not the people that are in trouble, not the people who didn't perform. They're all political payoffs to put the, for having put the guy in the office in the first place. Federal Chairman Bernanke's new money printing is the, it's the biggest thing since the Weimar Republic in Germany. What was the Weimar Republic? Well, there have been a lot of hyperinflations in this century. This whole list are hyperinflations just in this century. And some of them are very relatively recent, but the big, the granddaddy of them all, for many, in many people's mind, is the one in Germany. And uh, not only because it's the biggest, but it's the one that we've experienced in our family. My grandparents apparently had a uh, restaurant they sold to retire, and, w and when it w the escrow opened, it was enough to retire on. When the escrow closed, they got enough to buy one loaf of bread. What happened in Germany in this? The food prices doubled every 49 hours. A loaf of bread in 1920 cost one mark. A loaf of bread in 1923 cost 726 million marks. Famous event, series of events. One aspect of hyperinflation is once it starts, it feeds on itself and it escalates exponentially. These things take their shape in a matter of days and weeks, not months and years. On top of all of this, while this is going on, we've got some other interesting things. We've got constitutional crises going on. There's a thing called the War Powers Act. The Libya war was not authorized. That's an impeachable offense by definition. There are meetings going on. I personally am cynical enough to suspect there isn't the backbone or the leadership to bring these things home. There's a total disregard of the Constitution and in the executive branch of our government. So we either got to draw the line or realize that we've been converted to a dictatorship. What about the birth certificate? You hear all those rumbles about the birth certificate. They finally were forced to release a long form, as it's called, and the experts have quickly determined it was a fake document. Does that bother you? That's called fraud and deceit. That in itself should be a treasonous offense. Secrecy surrounding his time. How is it possible? Here's a sobering thing to reflect on. A guy about whom we know absolutely nothing. We don't know one grade he got in kindergarten through college, all the way through. We haven't run into anyone that knew him in those schools that will testify to his presence in those schools. We know absolutely nothing about him, and he's become the most powerful man on the planet Earth. That bother you? I'm not suggesting he's the Antichrist, but I could be wrong, but I don't think so. But the process by which he got there should give us sobering reflection. One of the titles of the Antichrist when he does show up is he's the man of lawlessness. The only thing worse than breaking laws is not to have any, being lawless. According to a new scientific poll as, as of June 16th through 19, half of all Americans want to see Congress investigate Barack Obama's eligibility for the presidency. That's no longer a fringe thing. The media would like you to believe it's being discounted. The reality is it's not. There's a growing awareness that we got a problem. Is there the leadership, the backbone anywhere in the legislature to take this on? No, no. If there isn't, We've just been converted to a dictatorship. 
I keep getting interview questions about the Mayan calendar. According to the fabled Mayan calendar, the world will come to an end on December 21st of 2012. And I usually explain to the interviewer he's, got, he's, he's not allowing for an error. Did you know there's an error in the Mayan calendar? And they look shocked. Oh, I didn't know that. Absolutely. There appears to be a 45-day error in the Mayan calendar because it appears to be scheduled, the world comes to an end on the second Tuesday in November of 2012. It, it takes most people only a couple of seconds to realize I'm talking about the elections in the United States. I told this to Joseph Farah, and it literally it was like less than a second when he just cracked up on the phone. I'm being facetious, but yet I'm making a point. America is in moral freefall. Our problem isn't political, it isn't financial. That's derivative of our primary problem. We are in moral freefall. We are the victims of spiritual warfare, wholesale. We have a media masking the truth. Study the 2008 elections and you make a, a shocking discovery that all these media organizations, large organizations, were in cahoots to hide the information. That's different than being a bias. The, 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 the uh, journalistic culture has always been liberal. Okay, anybody in public office knows that. No, this is something much more insidious. They actually conspired to hide the truth of the primary candidate running for president. That ought to be treasonous. We, they masked the truth. We have courts perverting justice. They reverse jury, jury decisions. They make laws. That's not their job to make laws, and on and on and on. We have schools that are deliberately dumbing down our youth. I used to think that the increasingly poor performance is poor management. Every year we spend more more dollars per student hour, and our results get worse. And I always thought, how can that be? It's just mismanagement. No, that's the agenda. Check out. Uh, get, there's several good books written about this. Check it out. I hope you don't believe that. I hope you check it out. See, we've replaced our traditional heritage with multiculturalism, revisionism, of course, values, relativism. And the one that hurts me the most, I guess, is that we've re relegated our, what was traditional patriotism to just some form of obsolete idol worship. <coughs> Have you ever wondered why governments always tend to toward corruption? Don't they always do that? They go towards corruption. That's why um, some say uh, you know a, re a revolution every no now and then is a good thing. Why are we surprised? Governments have always loved crises. They provide the rationale for increased budgets and bureaucracies subjugating the liberties of the population. That's why most dictators create external crises to consolidate their internal powers. When a dictator takes over, very quickly there's usually a war or something so he can consolidate his power. Well, in America they discovered you don't have to have military crises. There's others that'll work just as well. Your social crises work just as well as military ones. War on poverty, war on drugs, war on whatever. Pick something that sounds good and use that to build your budgets, remove liberties, now, there's one insight that was missing. I'm a systems guy, so there was still a part of the loop wasn't closed until I realized there's a missing link. How do you create social crises? With immorality. That's the way you create a social crisis, is immorality. Give the teenagers free sex. And on it goes. Let's diagram the overriding dynamic. Governments love military crises. That gives them budgets and excuse to steal freedoms. Except in America we discovered that social crises work just as well to do the same thing. Well, how do you get social crises? With immorality. Well, if immorality causes social crises and social crises favor governments, are we surprised that governments promote immorality? Same-sex marriages, you name it. And they, of course, feed on each other to grow and get worse and worse and worse. There is a cycle of nations. I'll use the, the these have several formats. I, I'm fond of Alexander Tyler. 1751, he, we go from bondage to spirit. He's talking about study of history. There's about half a dozen of these. They all come to the same conclusions, basically. Empires last roughly two centuries. They go from bondage to spiritual faith. From that spiritual faith, they get great courage. And with that courage, they establish some, a form of liberty. That liberty provides abundance. And that's our story. Our abundance has become the, the envy of the world. Watch out for envy. 
That abundance leads to complacency. The complacency leads to apathy. And you've heard me say this many times. Go down the street and ask anybody, what's the biggest problem in America? Is it ignorance or is it apathy? And they'll say, I don't know and I don't care. <laughs> and the effect says that by his actions. And that apathy leads to dependency. And we've got over 50% of our population on the government dole already. And that, of course, leads back to bondage. That's where we're headed, whether we realize it or not. Okay, the question we always get then, okay, why hasn't God judged America? We, we've spent, Gordon and I spent a good part of 20 years traveling and getting that question from all kinds of corners. Why is American prophecy? That's the one question. And we don't get that often anymore. People sort of realize that it may be arrogant for us to even presume we're going to be around by then. All the players in the end times are well identified. Where's America? That was one question. The other question is, why hasn't God judged America? Billy Graham quipped what, over 20 years ago. God doesn't judge America. You have to apologize to Sodom and Gomorrah. A great soundbite. Well, it's interesting that there's different wraths of God in the Scripture. There's appositional wrath. That's his wrath against sin in all its forms. There's catastrophical wrath, like the flood of Noah being an example. There is eschatological wrath, like Revelation 6 through 19 as an example. These are all different expressions of God's anger in various ways. But perhaps the most interesting one in many respects is his abandonment wrath. And uh, the, the, perhaps the clearest example of that is Samson in Judges 16, verse 20. That last visit to Delilah. He goes to break loose from his bonds and finds he can't. Can you imagine the shock that he was in? Previously, several times, he was able just to break loose and, and foil their, the shenanigans going on. Then he goes to do it, and he can't, and he realizes in that instant that God has abandoned him. What he used to be able to count on, he can't anymore. Well, does that happen on a larger scale? The northern kingdom. After Solomon dies, they go, they, there's a civil war, they split up, the northern king, kingdom goes in idolatry and goes from bad to worse. So God commissions Hosea to go there and give them his indictment. He doesn't go up there and preach unless you change, all these bad things are going to happen. No, no, no. He goes up and lays out what God's going to do because. Ten chapters of detail of God's indictment. It's all summarized in one verse. God says, uh, uh, leave Ephraim alone. He's joined to idols. In other words, God, what he's doing, he's standing back and letting the Assyrians go through and eliminate them from history. Well, the same thing, sort of, happens in the southern kingdom. Habakkuk is really upset because he looks at the southern kingdom and he sees them so far from God that he's upset about it. And so he goes to God about it, about his people. They're, they're sinful and all this. And God says, stand back. I'm going to do a work in your days that you will not believe even though I tell you. That's an oft-quoted verse, but many people, including myself, sometimes quote, I look back, I've quoted that out of context. God's telling Habakkuk he's going to deal with it in a, in a way that's going to surprise Habakkuk. When Habakkuk finds out what God's going to do, he's going to use, just as he used the Assyrians against the northern kingdom, he's going to use the Babylonians against the southern kingdom. Not to wipe them out, but to take them into captivity for 70 years. When Habakkuk finds out that's what God's going to do, he's more unglued than before. They're worse than we are. How can you use them? Our people are bad, but they're worse. God, nevertheless, that's what God's going to do. So as Habakkuk, uh, let's just take a look at this. Habakkuk chapter 2. It's really a two-chapter book. The third chapter is a prayer, Habakkuk. So it's a short little book. But starting at chapter 2, verse 1, he says, I will stand upon my watch and set me upon the tower. I will watch to see what he will say unto me and what I shall answer when I'm reproved. He's really confused. At first he wanted God to do something. Now what he realizes God's going to do, he doesn't understand. So he's going to go in the tower and, and try to understand what's going on. This isn't necessarily a literal tower. It may just be an attitude of mind. And here, in this way, the prophets are being compared to watchmen. And it's in that sense or in that spirit that we're going through this little uh, review. Because we're on the wall and we see things we have to call people's attention to, but we also realize that they 
may not understand what's going on. The key components here, determination. He didn't say that maybe next week or when it's convenient or when I can find time. He did it right then. He went into isolation, away from all distractions, radio, TV, telephone. We often can't hear the voice of God because so many other voices are constantly ringing in our ears. We need a quiet time, a quiet place, a quiet heart. We need to find a way in our busy lives to find some quiet time to reflect, to hear what God is saying. And then you need some expectation. Habakkuk was determined. He, he had gathered, gained some isolation. And then he had an expression. He says, I will see what the Lord will say to me. Notice, he didn't say, might say, I hope he'll say, I wish he'd say. No, I will. He had the confidence that God, he would hear from God. Do you have that confidence? That's something to pray about. There are many ways to please God, but none apart from faith. That's where we're headed here. Verse 2, the Lord answered me and said, notice what God says to Habakkuk, write the vision, make it plain upon the tables that he may run that readeth it. Really? That he may run that readeth it. Let's put this in the modern vernacular. Habakkuk, you're ready to do business. Take a memo. Be the messenger of the vision. Is God giving you a message here? Is he giving you a memo? Is he giving you a, a mandate, a charter? First question is, are you really serious about him? That issue is going to be challenged. For Every one of us are going to be challenged by that in this coming year. Every one of us in this room are going to be challenged about how serious we take God in this coming year. By the way, when you go before the Lord... Do you take pencil and paper in hand? When you pray, do you have a pad, a blank pad and a pencil with you? Have you ever been, those of you that have been in a large organization, a large corporation, have you ever seen the secretary go into the boss's office without a pad and pencil in their hand? They never think of entering the, 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 the boss's office without a way to jot down an assignment. Check me out. Any of you that's been in a, in a truly professional environment know what I'm talking about. Habakkuk continues, For the vision is yet for an appointed time, but at the end it shall speak and not lie. Though it tarry, wait for it, because it will surely come, it will not tarry. Is that a build-up for a key verse? The next verse is one of the most pivotal verses in the entire New Testament. This is the preamble. In the end it'll speak and not lie. Though it tarry, wait for it, because it will surely come, it will not tarry. In other words, be patient, don't panic. God has set a bound to all which displeases him. Really? Does America displease God? We could do a little montage of the same-sex marriage celebrations that were on television the last few days. I ran across a statistic that startled me the other day. If we add up all the people, I don't know if you've had any of you had deaths in, military deaths in your family. We've had a few in ours. I've been in Arlington. If you add up all the people that have died in wars in the United States, Civil War, First World War, Second World War, the whole, all of them, it adds up to 1.3 million people. It's quite a few. We murder 1.4 million people every year in mother's wombs. Remember what God said to Cain about Abel's murder? His blood crieth out. Oh. 
I used to preach, you all heard me, Second Chronicles 7.14, where God announces a principle to Solomon that I think we can apply to, he says, if my people who call by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven, forgive their sin, and heal their land. And I'm sure that's still true, and yet, I have to be honest with you, I find myself unable to really preach that anymore. That may be just a failing on my part, but I can't help but feel that we've crossed over, that we had our chance. God has set a bound to all that which pleases him. So we get to Habakkuk 2.4. That's the one verse you're going to remember for tonight. Where, behold, his soul which is lifted up is not upright in him, but the just shall live by his faith. Interesting little verse. Two groups are alluded to here. Those whose soul is lifted up, that's a bad thing. And the just who live by faith. They're in contrast. Whose soul is not upright. The Babylonians, in the context of the, the denotative context of this passage, Pride leads to death because it will not receive by faith the grace of God. And the best example is their leader, Nebuchadnezzar, in Daniel 4. Pride lifted him up and so forth. The watching prophet, come, uh, uh, to him, it comes the vision, with, it has three elements. The moral judgment of Yorivave upon the evils of the dispersed Israel. I'm dealing with the denotation here. The future purpose of God that the earth will be filled with knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the low waters cover the sea. In other words, the kingdom is going to be promised here and what follows. And yet meanwhile, even though there's a judgment and yet the kingdom is coming, in the meantime, this is their marching orders. The just shall live by faith. Well, really, what does that mean? Well, first of all, who are the just? The word is tzaddik, which means just, lawful, righteous, just or righteous in the governmental sense is included. Just right, like in one's cause, or righteous in conduct or character. Righteous is justified and vindicated by God. These are all nuances of what that word can mean. In any case, it's right, correct, or lawful. The just. We're together there? Okay. How shall the just shall what shall live? Kaya, which is to live, to have life, remain alive, sustain life, live pro pro <coughs> prosperously, live forever, be quickened, be alive be restored. These are all ways that word is used. To cause, to grow, to restore, revive, preserve, alive, let live. To quicken, revive, to restore, to revive. To, I'm trying to get the full flavor of that use, in, uh, that word. And by faith, amuna, firmness, fidelity, steadfastness, steadiness. By faith, not by intellect, sight, feelings, or touch. Faith is the currency of eternity. And God wants us to be rich people. And of course, we need to be weaned because we're addicted to intellect, sight, feelings, and touch. Habakkuk 2.4. The just shall live by his faith is what that says. The just shall live by his faith. What is it? Who are the just is the first question. Paul takes this verse and generates a trilogy of mandate to us. He takes the just and gives us the, book, the epistle to the Romans. He quotes this in the first chapter, verse 17. It becomes, the, the, the epistle of Romans is an elaboration of who the just are. You want to understand the just? You read Romans, the epistle. Okay. The just shall live by his faith. How shall they live? Paul writes an epistle to the Galatians. In chapter 3, verse 11, he quotes this verse as the pivot point of the whole letter. How do you live? By faith, not works. Okay. The just shall live by his faith. And Paul, I apologize to those who have a different view, writes the, Hebrew, the epistle to the Hebrews. If Paul didn't write Hebrews, this is even a bigger miracle, but I believe he wrote a trilogy on this verse. The just shall live by his faith. In fact, he quotes that verse in chapter 10, verse 38, just before the famous hall of faith we call chapter 11. So we have these three epistles. 
These three epistles are the trilogy that make up our marching orders for today. And the reason I've chosen this focus is because those are our marching orders that will see us through the turbulence that's coming. I would love to discover that I'm wrong, but I see very little possibility of being wrong about this. I think the country we live in is going into a period that no one's anticipating. We watch Wall Street very closely, and even the experts there don't get it. Some do. Some are beginning to. Clearly, in Washington, they don't get it. It's interesting, as I travel, I sometimes run into a very senior executive that's an old friend that we both happen to be in the International Lounge for different reasons, but at the same time, and so we sit down and share a little bit and so forth, and invariably the, the uh, discussion comes about how things are going in the United States. And uh, the remark is made that is so perceptive. When you're outside the United States, if you're in Europe or Asia, it's obvious how insane the politics and the decisions that are being made in Washington and Wall Street both, they're insanity. When you're in the United States, you don't see it. People are walking around like it's business as usual. You don't see any terror in their eyes. You're beginning to maybe a little bit here and there. But uh, it's so strange. It's one of those things that is clearer when you're outside watching it from the sidelines than when you're in the middle of it. Somehow, there's sort of a, a presumption on the part of people that it's somehow going to work out. Somebody will come up with a plan or someone's going to give in and somehow it's going to work out. Anyone that thinks that hasn't done the math. You're talking hundreds of trillions? You've got to be kidding. You, th those are astronomical figures. Those aren't budgetary figures. The wraths of God. We talked about Northern Kingdom, Southern Kingdom, America. And I think the marching orders are Habakkuk 2.4. And your commentary on that is three epistles that I charge you to read at your earliest convenient. Read the book of Romans to understand what we mean by the just. You read the book of Galatians, the epistle of Galatians to find out how we should be living. And you live by the faith that's profiled for you in Hebrews. This is my favorite picture of Wall Street. <laughs> Two buzzards waiting. You see, it's time for you and me to review our citizenship. I am not a Democrat for sure. I'm not a Republican either. There isn't a dime's worth of difference between them. Abraham looked for a city which hath foundations, whose builder and maker is God. That's not a glib poetic phrase. That is a, a uh, mandate. Now, I'm, I, I do this, done this a lot. You've seen me do it here before, but I want to do it again. I'm going to put, put a challenge on the screen. I'm doing it sincerely. I happen to really believe it. That's not the point. If you accept this challenge, you flunk the course. I believe you and I are being plunged into a period of time about which the Bible says more than it does about any other period of time in history, including the time that Jesus walked the shores of Galilee or climbed the mountains of Judea. Now, that period of time isn't going to be comfortable here in America we have an eschatological error I think just because if we do our homework we believe we can prove to ourselves that the church will not go through that three and a half year period that our Lord has specifically labeled the great tribulation I think we can from the text prove that we will not go through that period of time. 
But where do we get the arrogance to presume that we're going to be spared what most of the body of Christ in most of the world for most of the last 2,000 years has had to endure? Something that Jesus promised us, persecution. It's getting to be politically more politically incorrect to be a biblical Christian day by day than any time we've known living here in this country. It's getting tougher and tougher. And it's going to get much tougher. We discovered an interesting attitudinal thing in the Chinese church. They have what's called a kingdom perspective. They believe that they're in the kingdom of preparation. What we call the millennium, they call the kingdom of inheritance. They believe the responsibilities and authorities there will derive from their faithfulness here. They call that a kingdom perspective. We happen to discover this because they're, they're a very taken by the writings of a Dr. Timothy Lynn, who's a very famous translator of the... Uh, he was, he was on, on uh, George Jacobacus' team for the New American Standard Bible. Jacobacus is also the guy that's the chairman of the International Standard Version, su subsequent Bible. But the point is, uh, Dr. Lynn uh, taught in three of our major seminaries in the United States, but he did most of his writing in Mandarin. And his writings are the, one of the primary foundational documents He's sort of the C.I. Schofield of China, in a sense. Um, but it turns out the Chinese Christian, the, the Chinese, uh, English is a required second language, and they're, 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 they're covetous of, lang of, of uh, materials in English. But when they get his materials in English, it doesn't quite work. It's apparently there's, a, there's strange difficulties going from Mandarin to English. I gather the part of it, they don't have a past, present, future tense. In the it's, a, it's a different kind of structure. But in any case, the, the Chinese Christians have discovered the book that Nan and I published a year ago, and they feel that it's a paraphrase of Dr. Lin, so they've been gathering it for their leadership classes. And we wonder what's going on. That's where they explain to us how it's, what the, the, the particular emphasis that we've taken is, is consistent with the way they see things. They pray for the American Christians. Did you know that? They pray for persecution. They feel we won't get our act together until they're firing squads. You see. They're not being malicious or facetious. They, they really see the American Christian as needing to get serious, to be true ambassadors of Christ. Interesting perspective. Well, anyway, I, I put this challenge on the screen. To I, I want you to challenge this absurd preposterous proposition. To do that, you've got to do, you've just taken on two assignments, two challenges. The first, you've got to find out what the Bible says. That happens to be something you can't delegate. You've got to do that yourself. You can't delegate that to others. Now, the good news is we have a unique environment. Never before in the history of man has the Word of God been more available to every one of us. You can get into the original language without knowing Hebrew or Greek. You put your little arrow over any word in your translation, it'll pop up the background, tell you what the word is, how it's used, it'll diagram the sentence if you want, and so on. And you have these advanced information appliances now that you can't find a kid on the street without a color three-dimensional display doing some game or something. Well, those same things can have uh, biblical... And, and, and the software to do all of this is free by the way. Not all of it, some of it's expensive, but you can do what you need to do with free stuff. The internet resources are unbelievable. All of man's knowledge is a couple of keystrokes away. Think about that. That's not an exaggeration. It really is. Something else I want to throw in here, when you talk about finding out what the Bible says, there's no, in my 60 years of biblical involvement, the place I've always seen people grow is in small groups. Formal courses have their place. Weekly worship with the community has its place. But where people grow in their knowledge of the Word 
is in small groups, six to 12 people meeting during the week, studying the Word of God verse by verse, book by book. If you can't find one, start one. You do not have to be a teacher to lead a small group. You invite some friends over for coffee and donuts, pop a DVD into the player and discuss it. The Holy Spirit will take over. All you need is someone to keep order and keep one person from domi- prevent one person from dominating and all that sort of thing. Just be a facilitator. If you can't find a small group that you like, start one. We'll help you if you want. The second thing you've got to do is not as easy. You've got to find out what's going on. And uh, we call the first challenge the, the Berean Avenue of study. Bible, verse by verse, takes priority over everything else. The second part, find out what's really going on, we call for lack of another label, the Issachar Avenue of study. To be like the sons of Issachar who understood the times and knew what their country had to do. That covers prophecy, covers stewardship. And we've discovered the tools and resources there are antithetical to the resources in the first case. In the first case, you know it's true. That leads to a certain approach and certain kind of resources. The second case, you don't know what's true. You know what you're dealing with is biased and twisted and who knows. Different set of tools to use there. The first one is, the, is, is apologetical. It's, it's deductive. It's the, like the tools of a trial lawyer before a jury. The second one is more like the detective trying to figure out what really happened, what's really going on. What is truth, Pilate said? That is a challenge. Jesus gave us a command. Be not deceived. That wasn't a suggestion. It was a command. How do you do that? Well, you need to, we, li- we, we plunged in the age of deceit. It, most of what you've been taught in college ain't true. Now, I don't mean just political. I'm talking about physics, and whatever. It's amazing to discover how much mythology permeates our culture. Well, we don't believe in the theory of evolution. Fine, but your psychology, everything else in our culture is built on that basis. I, that's one, re- one of the things I'll also challenge you to do. You don't have to do it by getting our books. You can do it a lot of other ways. But I'm going to suggest one of the things that's changed my life is to prioritize my life moment by moment from the time I get up till the time I sleep by the kingdom. I don't serve a human ruler. I serve a coming king. And uh, I try to prioritize everything I do in terms of the kingdom. Because I know there's a final exam coming. And what worries me the most about that final exam is not my sin, which are many. They were all paid for on a cross 2,000 years ago. That's taken care of. What I know I'm going to worry, what's going to bring me to tears before that Bema seat will be confronted with the time I wasted. You know, if Whittier said it, if Whittier said it, all the words of tongue or pen, the saddest are these, it might have been, Those occasions when I wasn't bold enough to confront somebody about Christ. Those occasions when I wasted time on some frivol, trivial, frivolous nonsense. It's interesting, and I wrote a book on the kingdom, power, and glory, which primarily is a call to accountability, a focus to be an, not just to be saved, but to be an overcomer. And... Uh, it's astonishing to see the controversy this has generated. You want to generate controversy, start calling Christians to accountability. <whistles> oh, really? You mean there's a beam of seat? Yeah. We're all going to be there? Yeah. Well, I thought everybody in heaven's going to be equal. Really? <laughs> what about these seven different parables that tell, teach you just the opposite? Ten talents, ten pounds, you know, you, there's a whole list of them. The point being, they're not going to be equal. It's going to be, there are going to be rewards. There's going to be, a, you can't, you tell me I can lose my salvation. No, you can't lose your justification, no. Can you lose your inheritance? Absolutely. Ask Reuben about that. Ask the prodigal son about that. Ask Esau about that and go on. No, inheritance can be lost in the Old Testament. It can be lost in the New Testament. 
Your, your salvation? No. Your inheritance, rewards? Absolutely. That's what rewards are. They're rewards for having done something right. Being available to the Spirit. Not doing something on your checklist, doing something on His checklist. We have the, uh, the we have a custom uh, studies that go with us, the origin of evil. Thy kingdom come, what is it? Most Christians have no idea what they're praying for in the Lord's Prayer. Thy kingdom come, what are they talking about? Most people don't know because the churches haven't taught that there is a kingdom on the earth that Jesus is going to run. Eternal security. You mean I can lose my salvation? If you can lose your salvation, i got a new name for God. Butterfingers. It's his responsibility to keep you once you've accepted Christ. And of course, the whole area of inheritance rewards is a minefield for many. But the way you keep out of error with all of these isn't with those studies, it's with the last one, the whole counsel of God. Every view you have should fit into the total package. That's your checkpoint. Because in the, in the road, there are a lot of potholes and places that you've got you to do a little bit of homework. And that's your, your equalizer, if you will. And, for, there's, and I, wanna, I, I wanna, don't want to conclude this without pointing out that we have a resource you need to be aware of. And uh, the Koine Institute, that many of us believe it has emerged, this unusual organization, for just such a time as this. Are you saved? How many of you are saved? Can I see your hands? Okay, are you prepared to write down why? Do you take a pad and answer the question, why did God save you? Well, to magnify his name. Sure, there's some collective reasons. No, I mean, why did he save you? I'm going to argue that he had a mission, uh, an idea for you. Have you discovered your calling? You're saved? Fantastic, praise God. What's your calling? Well, I'm not a pastor. No, I didn't say you have to be a pastor. Well, what is your calling? Have you discovered it? How do you discover it? What gifts has he given you that are supernatural? And from, are you in a fellowship committed to help preparing you for that calling? Did you know there is such a thing? You don't have to go anywhere, be anywhere. You can join a fellowship that will, whose commitment is to help you prepare for whatever you believe your calling is. And what have you invested in that preparation? God's called you to do something. Have you invested to prepare in whatever he's called you to do? Your time? Ah, your priorities? That's even tougher. We have a volunteer think tank that, for Christians. And Dan Stolberger, the executive director, and I have a little different perspective. He says it's open to everybody. It's for anybody. And he's right. It's my suspicion it's a little different. But I think it's for those that are really serious. It's a worldwide, lifetime fellowship for those that want to do it. It's non-denominational, but it's very fundamental. It's bound, it's, it, 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 it binds together by its hermeneutic. We take this text of the Bible seriously. It's not a replacement for local church. It's a supplement, not a replacement for local church. It makes no attempt to displace that name. For quite the contrary. Many people are grateful for the Institute because it allows them to attend the church they like. They love the pastor. They love the programs for the kids. They love the church. They're just a little frustrated because they want more deeper, deeper study. Here's a way to do that without having to go, go shopping for another church. It's a transnational fellowship committed to support your personal calling, whatever it turns out to be. And you do it on your own clock and on your own schedule. But the, setting all this aside, what's your action plan? What's God calling you to do? If you're saved, you said you were, your hand came up, what is What's your calling? I'm going to suggest that God is not finished with any one of us in this room, me included. God is asking me to raise the bar on my personal walk too. What is that going to involve? Be different for each one of us and yet it'll be in common in this sense. Every one of us has a need to commit to a systematic program to really learn our Bible. Well, I read it devotionally every day. Different thing, that's fine. I'm not suggesting to displace that, not at all. There's a very special place for that. Devotional reading, absolutely. No, I'm talking about expositional study where you really learn your Bible. That's a lifetime thing. And the best way to do that is be involved in a small group. I encourage you to look at that. But whatever it is, I'm going to suggest you respond to it tonight. Be between you and your Lord. When you turn in tonight, think about it, pray about it. What does he want you to do? Respond to his calling. Find out what that calling is and let it prioritize the rest of your life. 
He said, Behold, I come quickly. Hold that fast which thou hast, that no man take thy crown. Ooh, that's quite an interesting verse. You mean there's something you can lose? Not your salvation. That's in his hands, and he's faithful. But there is a crown, and that's a collective for a lot of different rewards. Hold fast which thou hast, that no man take thy crown. You are in danger of losing that crown by not being an overcomer. So let's stand for a closing word of prayer. Incidentally, we'll have a, we'll have a uh, bibliography attached to the thing. We have a how to prepare for any disaster, a little pamphlet that's terrific, humorous, but very helpful. And uh, Ray Gano has put a book together called Survive the Coming Storm, The Value of a Preparedness Lifestyle. And uh, it, it is incredible. The, it's a simple little book. It's, you know, it's 100 pages. Well, 180 pages, 160 pages. Um, and there's others. We'll, we'll include a bibliography for those that want to do a little bit of homework about, okay, how do I prepare for, for the coming storm, whatever it is? Let's bow our hearts. Father, we thank you for who you are, and we thank you that you've brought us together, and we thank you that you love us so much as to warn us of what's afoot. And we do pray, Father, that through your Holy Spirit and through your word, that we will be overcomers, that we will be effective stewards of the opportunities you're going to create ahead, of us, for, ahead for us. Father, we just do look to you to be the author and finisher of our faith. We do pray, Father, that you would help each of us to grow in grace the knowledge of him that when confronted, we will be, we'll acquit ourselves in a way that will please you. As we commit ourselves right now before the throne, we commit ourselves to you in the name of Yeshua, our coming King indeed. Amen. <clears throat> Amen. God bless you.